And just to confirm, Jonay, we're going to um, take videos off just only when we speak. Yeah, I know you said that. Sorry. What, yeah, if, you, if you're uh, not speaking, you should just go ahead and turn your video off and your microphone off, except for Q&A. I think, yeah. um, probably clear, I don't think you need to be on video unless you want to be, but I know that can be awkward. <laughs> but um, Yeah, just the speaker. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. No problem. I'm going to do a quick sound check here on our video. Let me just uh, make sure this is working. Just let me know if you can hear it or not once it starts playing. The 2020 election will forever be remembered as one of the most extraordinary elections. Does that sound good? Can you hear it? Sounds great. Okay. All right. Well, um, we are at uh, four o'clock here, so I'm going to get the live stream going here. Um, I will give you the go ahead when we're live, uh, Lisa, to start things off here. So just one moment.
Okay, we're going to be live in five, four, three, three. two, one. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for our first webinar of the year. After the COVID-19 pandemic started last year, we launched our People Planet Public Health webinar series to keep you all engaged on the most pressing issues facing our state, from water contamination and air quality issues to voting rights and much more. We had great speakers join us in 2020, and we continue the series this year so that you can hear from leading experts on the issues impacting all of us. I'm pleased to say we're starting out our 2021 series with Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson alongside a voting rights advocate and an elections expert. The issue we'll be discussing today couldn't be more timely or important. I'd like to start by taking a step back though and saying thank you to Secretary of State Benson, all the county clerks and the thousands of poll workers and election workers who stepped up last year to ensure that Michiganders across our great state were able to cast their votes safely and securely. This was really no easy feat as you know, COVID-19 brought unprecedented challenges to our leaders and our elected officials and our election workers took those challenges head on and democracy prevailed. The voters of Michigan also deserve our thanks, not only for their participation in, the, in our democracy, but frankly, for their approval of Proposal 3 in 2018, which made voting easier and more accessible by, by allowing no reason absentee voting. In 2020, Michiganders took advantage of all these new rights, casting their ballots in ways that felt the safest for them, whether that was through mail-in ballots, secured ballot drop boxes, or voting right at their local clerk's offices. And this was a huge success story. Unfortunately, some have used the pandemic and last year's historic election to sow doubt instead of confidence in our election system. And this false narrative that's been crafted is now manifesting in measures that are clearly designed to suppress voters. In Georgia, legislation was, was signed into law that makes sweeping changes to the state's election rules, reducing drop box locations, shortening time allowed to count ballots, giving voters less time to cast their ballots, and even prohibiting people from giving water to voters waiting in line at polling locations. We're seeing similar measures being proposed right here in Michigan, with a 39 bill package recently introduced in the Michigan Senate. It's clear that being engaged in protecting our democracy and voting access to the ballot box is more important than ever. These efforts to suppress voters do not reflect the will of Michiganders, and it's not who we are. That's why more than 100 people rallied on the steps of the Capitol this Tuesday led by the Detroit branch of the NAACP, taking a stand against this legislation. And it's also why 30 of Michigan's biggest business voices, like General Motors and Ford, recently came out in strong opposition to any efforts to disenfranchise voters. We clearly saw that in 2020, Michiganders found huge value in their new ways to vote safely and securely. Our democracy works best when people participate and we should be making voting, the voting process as accessible as possible. Today, I'm joined by leaders and experts who will discuss just that. You'll be hearing in the following order from Michigan LCV Education Fund's Democracy for All Director, Claire Allenson, the Michigan Director of All Voting is Local, Agogo Adevie, Pontiac City Clerk, Garland Doyle, and Michigan Secretary of State, Jocelyn Benson. Following our conversation, we'll have some time for questions from the audience. For those of you on Zoom, you can click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and type your question there. And for those of you tuning in on Facebook Live, feel free to ask your questions in the comments section. Towards the end, we'll also launch a short survey on Zoom for participants and it'll pop up on your screen with information about how you can get involved. Thank you for joining us today. I'll now turn things over to Claire Allenson. Thank you, Lisa. Our Democracy for All team is proud to continue to work alongside numerous partners, including those joining us in this virtual event today in protecting the freedom to vote. Last year, amid a rapidly changing landscape, our team engaged voters over the phone, by text, through interactive QR code, voting rights lawn signs, even chalking with our young neighbors. 
Our goal was simple, ensure voters knew of their expanded rights, including the right to vote before election day, whether in person at a clerk's office or satellite or by mail and Dropbox, Voters seized this opportunity and look forward to doing so again this year and every year. Our team also engaged our local clerks to ensure that voters were provided the access they needed and that clerks as our local election administrators had the support they needed, especially sufficient poll workers to get the job done and done well. The work continued past election day with teams with team members working hard to ensure that ballots were counted and that the election was certified. Poll workers across the state and especially at Detroit's TCF Center reminded this state and this nation of the deep care for democracy that they brought to their work. They further reminded us with their dedication that every vote counts and our community's right to participate. Poll workers at TCF Center and all across the state should be celebrated for their courage and integrity. Our work this year will build upon all of these efforts, ensuring access for voters and supporting our clerks in critical local elections this year, especially here in Detroit, as well as organizing alongside our partners to prevent any rollback of voting rights. With that, I would love to get the conversation started with our esteemed guests. Thanks again for taking the time to join us on a busy day. And it's my pleasure to kick things off and introduce the Michigan Director of All Voting is Local, Agogo Adavie. Over to you. Thanks for having me, Claire. And it's, it's wonderful to be with everyone on this panel today uh, with our wonderful Secretary of State, but also with all of you who are watching and interacting with us in this webinar today. Um, All Voting is Local is a, a national group that is based in eight different states, including Michigan. And we're focused on making sure that elections are administered in a fair way that allows for there to be equal access to the ballot by all citizens and all those people who want to vote. Um, last year, we worked on a number of different initiatives uh, to help make sure that the election was successful, one in which we believe, in which all the evidence has shown uh, was successful for millions of Michiganians who were able to express their right to vote. Um, we worked on making sure that uh, multiple jurisdictions across the state uh, installed drop boxes. Uh, I think it's important to note that with the secretary's rate uh, work, there was a 60% increase of drop boxes from the August primary to the November general election. And this had significant consequences. In Sterling Heights alone, 83% of the voters in that uh, city returned their absentee ballots via a drop box. Uh, we also worked with LCV to ensure that people requested their absentee ballots. We sent out hundreds of thousands of uh, texts to voters all across the state. Um, we partnered with LCV to make follow-up calls and reached a lot of people to make sure that they were getting their ballots in time. Uh, we also pushed for prepaid postage, which the secretary was grateful, uh, was, which we're grateful that the secretary of state took action on. And the one thing I'd like to point out is that in this 39 bill package, it would eliminate the possibility of the secretary of state to do that. And it would also eliminate the possibility of even a local jurisdiction. Let's say if Oakland County, or if the city of Sterling Heights, or any city decided that they would want to reimburse their citizens or pay for the postage for their citizens to return their absentee ballot, they would be precluded from doing that. Uh, it, it's a, certainly a top-down top down approach that's not helpful. Uh, but one of the things we, we worked on a, a lot and that I think is helped inform our uh, viewpoint on these bills is we recruited poll challengers and poll challengers are people who have the right under Michigan law to observe the election process and under certain circumstances to file formal challenges with the clerks and with the jurisdiction uh, that they're working in. Um, we recruited poll challengers simply to be there so that we could protect people's right to vote. Um, 
and we also observed other challenges from other groups who were there and our experiences were different. Um, we made sure to train all of our poll challengers on Michigan law so that they knew what to look for. They knew how to protect people's votes. But a lot of the people who were there were not trained. And you know, at TCF on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, we repeatedly saw these things of people who were not up to speed on the law, who were trying to interfere in the process and basically you know, obstruct it. And you know, some of the, the bills that have been introduced uh, in this session and this 39 uh, bill package would further the obstruction. Um, you know, there's a, an element that would allow videotaping within these um, counting boards. Uh, you know, one of the reasons why this is not a good idea, in Georgia, they allow this. And in Georgia, people who didn't want to protect the people's right to vote used that video and altered it to misinform the voters. I think everybody should be uh, able to view the process and under certain circumstances be involved, but we don't want it to become a circus. Um, you know, it also in, in this pill package, a certain uh, provision would allow for an increase in the number of challenges, challengers being in these rooms. Uh, this caused a lot of disruption uh, in Detroit and the TCF Center where you know, essentially the place was overrun by a lot of folks. So this is quite dangerous. Um, in addition to that, in the pre-processing element of the 39 uh, bill package would essentially say the same. And we saw that it took much longer than I think anybody would have liked because there was not enough pre-processing time and counting time before uh, election day to allow uh, for the you know, votes to be counted in a safe, transparent, and uh, diligent manner. And so what we should be focusing on going forward is actually having real early voting where voters can go to their clerk's office, vote, and put their own ballot in a tabulator. And that would reduce a lot of the, the workload on our local clerks. We should be allowing for at least two weeks of pre-processing so that clerks can plan and adjust to the new reality. You know, this past year alone, 60% of all Michiganians voted absentee. They voted before election day. That's a huge increase. If just four, four years before, it was only 26%. And clerks need the time to adjust. And we also need funding. Uh, it's very curious that under this bill, you know, the uh, law proposed would ban outside sources of funds to be used to support clerk operations. Uh, you know, clerks really struggled to meet the resources and meet the demand of this past year. Uh, in Detroit alone, uh, some of the outside funding helped to boost uh, the pay for these wonderful poll workers to get them ready to uh, you know, volunteer and work under really stressful conditions. Uh, if you eliminated that funding and didn't supplement it with additional funding from the state, it would really cut into the amount of uh, you know, workers you could pay to do this type of work. And yes, it, we, it's not ideal to have outside sources of money, but the, the state of Michigan, the state legislature should step up and fulfill the role and make sure that all elections across our state are properly funded. So you know, we're fully engaged in this work. Um, we're working hard with um, LCV, and with clerks all across the state to get the message out that this is a package of bills that is unhelpful, uh, that is gonna restrict the right to vote and not allow people to have their voices heard, which is critical and the foundation to our democracy. Uh, and so with that, I will turn it back over to you, Claire. Thank you so much. Robert. Really appreciate uh, those thoughtful comments. And I know I, and I'm sure our attendees are really looking forward to driving, diving into this in greater detail during our Q&A. 
Um, up next, we are uh, going to move on to the local administrator point of view, uh, that essential on the ground um, implementer of our elections. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Pontiac City Clerk, Garland Doyle. Thank you so much for joining us today. Claire, thank you uh, for having me. Um, I'll just start by kind of explaining the role of the uh, local clerk. Um, I'm responsible for the administration of elections in the city of Pontiac. What that means is that every time there is an election, I have to make sure that residents know there's election, how they can vote, whether they can vote by absentee ballot or at their polling location on election day. Besides informing um, voters, I have to make sure that all our polling locations are adequately staffed. That means recruiting and training poll workers to work on election day. In most um, cases, local clerks are accountable to their election commission. In Pontiac, the election commission consists of myself as the city clerk, our uh, city attorney and the city treasurer. I'm also accountable to the uh, county clerk and ultimately to the uh, secretary of state who is the chief elections officer in our state. The 2020 election year was historic. Clerks had to administer elections during a pandemic and there was record turnout. Additionally, this was the first major election where there was no reason absentee voting. I expected that absentee voting would increase, but to the degree that absentee uh, voting increased was um, enormous. Just to share some numbers with you, in 2016, for the uh, general election, um, you know, four years ago when there was a presidential election, we issued 4,769 absentee ballots. 2020, we issued 16,501 absentee ballots. Uh, the number of people who came to the polls and who voted by absentee kind of flipped because in 2020, 67% of Pontiac voters who voted, voted by absentee ballot and 33% went to the polls. As opposed to in 2016, 77% of the voters went to the polls and 23% voted by uh, absentee. That really had an effect on as far as like uh, resource um, allocation. Uh, normally, we may add one to three um, part-time or like full-time assistance as it gets closer, uh, temporary staff as it gets closer to helping us in the office with the administration of elections. In 2020, I had to, um, I had five full-time and three part-time additional staff members in addition to the uh, people that already staff the clerk's office. This was um, made possible largely because the city of Pontiac received a $405,640 grant from the Center for Tech and Civic Law. And alluded to before about uh, outside money um, helping, but without the um, CTCL grant, I would be facing a major budget deficit. Uh, normally my entire election budget is around $280,000. Uh, I had budgeted $13,300 for part-time help, which was an increase um, from the previous year. Uh, to give you some more numbers, I spent almost $49,000 on temporary assistance. And then as it relates to election day, a staff, I had $60,000 budgeted for both the primary in general, and I you know it's been no more than $60,000. And I spent almost $110,000, largely because we increased, because we were facing a pandemic, it was hard to recruit um, poll workers. It increased the uh, salary, um, the pay for poll workers. And I did find that to be really beneficial because we were uh, able to recruit a number more um, poll workers. We really have a hard time recruiting um, poll workers um, by state law. We're required to have three people at each one of our uh, precincts. Um, we had on average six to seven in this past uh, November election, but normally it's a hard for us to recruit the 105 um, poll workers that we have. This time we had around 200. And I think that was largely in due to the increased amount of money. Uh, we're often asked, um, what could the legislature do to improve elections um, administration? I actually would like to talk about what they cannot do. Um, just became familiar with a few of the bills 
like for example, Senate Bill 285, which will require um, absentee ballot applicants to mail clerks a copy of their photo ID or bring it to the clerk's office. Hard enough already with absentee ballots if a person forgets to assign their ballot, we do contact them, but it's hard to get them to come in. So we would add another barrier by telling them now you've got to, in essence, send in your, your photo ID. We're matching their signature based upon their um, identification that is in the state's uh, database. So I just see this as an undue problem, which would cause unnecessary increased work from the uh, clerk's office um, perspective. Another thing, uh, uh, Senate Bill, I think 273 would require the approve, um, the Secretary of State and County Board of Canvassers to approve drop box locations. Um, we have seven ballot drop boxes in the city of Pontiac. We did not have them for the uh, primary, but we did have them for the general election. They really came in handy. We have seven voting districts, so I made sure that um, one was placed in each one of our voting districts. And Primarily about 75% of our ballots were returned to the um, ballot uh, drop boxes. So I could see this as being a potential problem. If we limit the number of drop boxes or limit their locations, our drop boxes were secure. They were under 24 hour surveillance. I think it's really beneficial to the voters because you don't have to stop at the post office, worry about, um, we know about all the mail delays um, last year about whether your ballot is going to get in on time, you drop it in the drop box. We were um, checking our drop boxes daily. And as it closer got to the election, we were um, checking them multiple times um, throughout the day. And you could see when we received your ballot. So it just to me ran a lot in essence um, smoother. And then the one of them that I find most egregious that we would have to be required to lock our drop boxes. I think this is Senate Bill 280. Uh, 6 by 5 p.m. the day before um, the election. When this past election, voters were allowed just as if they went to their polling location, they could return their ballot to the drop box by uh, 8 p.m. At 8 p.m. we did lock the um, ballot. Uh, this year we will have a municipal election in the city of Pontiac for 2021. Some of the things that I think will be similar if these bills are not allowed to go through, we will utilize our drop boxes. I think they will, because um, they're permanent um, drop boxes. Uh, the other thing I think that is uh, really beneficial with the absentee uh, voting, during municipal elections, the voter turnout uh, decreases. Uh, four years ago, only 5,822 voters participate in our municipal election. By that, I mean mayor, city council and our uh, library on board. Already as a result of the 2020 election, I have um, nine over 9,000 voters on our permanent absentee list. So that means I'll be required to uh, mail them out a absentee ballot application for the uh, primary and general election. And I think as a clerk, I think it's kind of my responsibility to ensure that everyone can vote, that everyone is informed. Um, that there is an election. So to try to decrease the opportunity for people to vote, I just didn't think that it really helps our um, democracy. And I think the more people that participate overall, democracy benefits as a result of that. Just to uh, talk about how um, participants in this uh, webinar can help, um, I'm really thankful and I'm glad that the Secretary of State is on the call um, through her MVP program. She really helped us recruit a lot of uh, poll workers for the presidential election. Um, I would like to see people uh, help us with this uh, municipal election as well. So feel free to serve as a uh, poll worker. We won't be able to pay what we paid uh, last year, but we still will pay um, much more than we have um, paid in the past. And to uh, share our voter education materials. Uh, as the clerk, one thing I did do was I did um, some educational videos. I uh, launched a website, PontiacCityClerk.com. It had a, like a, what every voter needs to know um, page, because again, I really feel it's my responsibility to uh, educate the uh, public about the process. So that kind of concludes my comments. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Clerk Doyle and Agogo, for your really important comments and perspective. Um, before uh, we introduce our very special guest, Secretary of State Benson, I'd like to now play a short video that was produced by our communications team and highlight some of the challenges of last year's elections, as well as the successes. The 2020 election will forever be remembered as one of the most extraordinary elections in American history. Unprecedented challenges. Unprecedented elections. Unprecedented election. Record numbers of votes were counted. 19.8 million Americans have already voted in next month's election. Despite a record amount of ballots already cast, long lines are expected tomorrow. Despite a global pandemic and changing voting restrictions. But voting isn't easy for everyone. There are regulations in place that make it harder for some people to vote. Poll workers revealed themselves to be the heroes of the election, counting votes for hours on end. Moving and working to make sure that everything gets counted. Remaining focused through intimidating situations. <laughs> Yet we have and will continue to rise to the occasion. That's because this year so many people are allowing their voices to be heard. It was a record turnout of voters, Heather, in Michigan. And protect the right to vote. The vote is the heart of American democracy. We all believe that passionately. After the monumental successes of last year. This year's election was, quote, the most secure in history. Now is not the time to roll back the clock on access to the ballot. Now I'd like to introduce our final speaker, and it's a great pleasure to do so, Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson. Secretary Benson played a key role and displayed amazing leadership in 2020 when in the midst of a global pandemic, she guided our state through a safe, secure election process. Her strategy was very clear. Make sure that Michiganders know all of their rights and options, allowing voters to choose the safest routes and the ones that make the most sense for them individually and it paid off. A record number of voters, as we just heard, voted safely by mail at their clerk's offices and through secure drop boxes. The election ran smoothly and Michiganders were able to make their voices heard with confidence. I wanna thank you, Secretary Benson, for both your leadership through the last election and your persistence in keeping us moving forward, making voting even more accessible so more Michiganders can participate fully in our democracy. Um, Secretary Benson, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Lisa, and thank you all for having me here today. Uh, you know, our democracy was tested last year by a global pandemic and historic efforts to undermine the will of the voters, and yet it prevailed. And so I want to talk a little bit about uh, the work that we did to ensure uh, that it would indeed prevail, and also the battles ahead, uh, because in many ways, uh, the, the battle over the future of our democracy is escalating, and we've got a lot of work to do to ensure that uh, citizens uh, continue to have the preeminent role in our democracy, making sure their voices are heard. And I want to thank all of you for the work that you did uh, last year and, and really for years now, uh, making sure that we have a state and a democracy that embraces every vote. But the work is not over. Uh, and if history teaches anything, it's a reminder that the work to secure and preserve our democracy is ongoing. Uh, I, as Congressman John Lewis said, democracy is a verb. It requires all of us uh, to continue the work to protect everyone's right to have their voices heard and their votes counted in our country. So I'll start by talking about 2020, which, uh, as was mentioned in that great video and really underscored by anyone seeking to tell the truth about the 2020 election, it was the most secure, successful and accessible election in our state's history. In part, this was because in 2018, so many of you worked to amend our state constitution to give citizens the right to vote absentee, to ensure that citizens wishing to register to vote on election day had a right to do so, to make sure eligible citizens are automatically registered to vote when they interact with our Secretary of State office, and a number of other rights that made Michigan's democracy one that was in line with some of the best democracies and states in our country. 
So my work from taking the day I took office in January 2019 up through election day last year was to take that mandate from voters and make it a reality for every citizen in our state. And indeed we did. We implemented the voter registration changes in 2019. And in time for our March 10th election, the presidential primary in 2020, we had uh, procedures in place all across the state to ensure voter registration was protected and also that citizens had that right to vote absentee realized no matter where they lived or who they voted for. And then two hours after the polls closed in that March 10th presidential primary, which saw great success and also set us, had set us on a path towards success in November, the coronavirus came to Michigan. And we received a call from the governor that the two first two cases of the virus would be, had been identified and would be reported that night. Uh, so that said, uh, we immediately adjusted and adapted our plan through weekly meetings and monthly goals to make sure that we were ready in the midst of a pandemic to still give citizens the certainty and clarity on how to vote and how to ensure their voices were heard. That started with the decision not to, promote, not to postpone any elections, but to instead use them as opportunities to prepare for November. And that's exactly what we did in May, where we had local citizens all across the state in local elections vote. Almost all of them, 99% chose to vote absentee. Shortly after then, it was clear that mailing citizens absentee ballot application request forms was one of the most efficient and effective way to ensure they knew their option to vote absentee in the upcoming August and November elections. That was a procedure that worked very well in May and that we replicated for August and November again to great success. Indeed, by the time the August election rolled around, 2.5 million citizens voted in that primary. 2.5 million citizens. That was twice the number of people who typically voted in that election, and more even than the number of citizens who had voted in the 2018 August primary, where we saw contested gubernatorial elections on both sides of the aisle at the statewide level. So without even a contested statewide election on the ballot, citizens voted in record numbers in that August primary, and that showed us to be prepared for November. We had to prepare for and embrace the likelihood of record-breaking turnout. And indeed, that's just what happened. 5.5 million citizens voted in 2020's November election. And of those, 3.3 million voted absentee. Those were extraordinary numbers, but they were numbers we were prepared for, that we had built an infrastructure to prepare for. By the way, without the help of the state legislature, who we repeatedly asked to give us more time on the front end to allow clerks to process and tabulate and, and, and those absentee ballots, that were coming in for weeks prior to the, the day the polls closed on November 3rd. Yet even without the help of the legislature, we were able to increase the capacity of our clerks to tabulate the two or sometimes three times as many absentee ballots than they ever had before through more machines, more personnel, including the 30,000 individuals, many of you included, who signed up to be election workers for the first time last year. So all in all, we prevailed. We saw more people vote than ever before. We were able to tabulate those absentee ballots, again, 3.3 million, three times the number of absentee ballots that our system had to tabulate in 2016. They were tabulated and our full unofficial results were ready to be reported within 24 hours of the polls closing on uh, Wednesday, the day following election day. Notably, Pennsylvania, Arizona, Georgia, a number of other states took until Friday to do the same process. Similarly, going through a very a system just like ours, same sorts of data, same lack of support from the state legislatures, uh, but I'm proud that we were able to get out in front of it and through the incredible work of our clerks that you've talked about already, really have an efficient results uh, prepared for our citizens and be able to move forward from there. Now, the last thing I'll say on that is, we thought after those unofficial results were done that we were done. We knew there were local canvases, the state canvassing and all the rest. But we thought at that point, the battle over the misinformation that was flooding into our state to undermine people's faith in democracy had been done, had been won, was behind us. Little did we know that things were just beginning. And of course, whether it was the local Wayne County Canvas Board meeting, the state canvassers meeting, or the day in December, not just when people showed up outside of my home in the dead of night to protest the election, but also when we showed up at the Capitol, the state Capitol, to certify and ensure that the uh, electoral college vote went smoothly. All of that and through every step of the process, we saw efforts to undermine through a PR campaign and dozens of frivolous lawsuits, the will of the people. And so when January 6th came along, which of course a great tragic day and tragic moment and a real culmination of the misinformation we saw percolate and, and compound uh, throughout the election cycle, 
We indeed thought that that would be the end of it, but it wasn't. And in fact, things only continue to escalate. And the new battlefront is in our state legislatures, Georgia, Texas, Florida, Arizona, and even here in Michigan, we're seeing almost identical language being proposed in state legislatures to undo the very same policies that contributed to the success of our elections in 2020. So the new battlefront that's emerged is right here in Michigan, in our state legislature, to push back on the 39 bills that have been proposed and ensure that they don't become law, whether through the legislative process or through any workarounds that, that would seek to be developed to overcome a, a governor's veto. And so the work, my friends, continues. The work will continue through 2022, through 2024. And really what we learned in 2020 was that it takes good people, people on both sides of the aisle, acting with integrity, voting, participating, and then protecting those results to ensure that democracy prevails. And so, so many of you did that work. And I'm asking you now to continue that work because we will, when we work together, ensure that our democracy survives. But as history teaches us, it requires us all working together to reach that goal. So with your help, we can do that, but know that the work is not done. Uh, and, uh, and it's time now to focus on this legislative battle that's emerging so that we can ensure we protect the very policies that voters want and then ensured our successful democracy last year. Thanks. Thank you, Secretary Benson. Really, really appreciate you taking the time. I know that your schedule is probably very, very full. So um, we're gonna move to um, questions from the audience and I can already see a number of them coming in. And I wanna remind people who are tuning in through Zoom to ask your questions by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And those that are watching um, on Facebook Live, use the comment section there, we're monitoring both. Um, the first question is for Secretary Benson, um, and it's from Brittany, who wants to know, how can voters best prepare for local elections this year? I think a number of things. One, note that we're still in the midst of a pandemic. And so making sure that citizens know they have a right to vote absentee, the very same policies that were in place in 2020 are in, pol are in place now. Find out how you can request to vote by mail. You can do so on our website or through an application to your clerk's office. You can return your ballot. I think the bottom line is to contact your local clerk, find out information about the details leading up to the May election and anything you may need to ensure that you have a full knowledge of your options to, to re receive and return a ballot. Uh, and then in furtherance of those options, you're working to uh, ensure that other citizens know that as well and spreading the word uh, and then if you are so inclined, volunteer to be an election worker in May. Uh, there's still a need, uh, just as there was last year and throughout every election last year, to make sure that citizens are able to protect the vote through serving in those important roles. And you can go to our website, michigan.gov slash democracy MVP to sign up to be an election worker in your community. Thank you. Um... I have another question. Uh, I think this might be for all of the panelists, but um, Kate wants to know, do you feel that signature verification is adequately secure and an okay way to verify a ballot? Would you change that in any way? Really the studies show and the data shows that signature ver verification is the most reliable way of identifying a voter's identity because it's much harder, nearly impossible to forge someone's signature successfully even more harder than it is to forge or, or present a fake ID. So for that reason, signature verification and identification has been used in many forums in many ways to verify citizens' identity. And it's shown to be the best and certainly the most secure protocol for voting because everyone can produce a signature for the most part in varying ways. And of course, you have to provide accommodations for those who, who are unable to do so. But by doing so, you don't, you, you, you don't run the risk that any integrity protections unintentionally disenfranchise citizens. And, and by doing so, we can ensure that we have uh, secure protocols in place that also protect access to the vote. Anything any of our other panelists would add to that or shall I move on to the next question? I'll add um, briefly um, to that. Um, during the past election, um, we have to verify signatures. There were a couple voters who were actually the voters and their signature did not um, match. And they would come in and it's like, you know, this is me, but I would have them pull out their driver's license. I'm like, okay, 
look at your signature on your driver's license. Does this, in essence, match the signature that's on this ballot? Because as we're often now, we're signing a lot of things. I know myself, I don't always sign the way I really sign uh, important documents. So one important thing that um, I did was we did um, a postcard mailing and reminding voters to sign their uh, ballots, to sign like you sign on your driver's license or state ID. And I think that was really helpful. So to go along with the Secretary of State, it is really a clear way to validate the card to repeat someone. Great, thank you, Clerk Doyle. Um, I have another question uh, coming in here. This one's from Anne, and she wants to know, um, what can we do as individual citizens to help make sure absentee ballot voting and drop boxes as they are now stay in place? It, it, she says it was a great achievement to get uh, to that point to help people uh, make it easier, make it easier for people to exercise their right to vote and would love to have it stay that way. What can individuals do? Right now, under the law, it's really a decision of the local clerk uh, to implement drop boxes and put them in place. Uh, many of them that were in place successfully in 2020 remain in place. Uh, and the best thing to do at this point, although we'll, we will be working closer towards when we get to the statewide election again to make sure there's a statewide uh, opportunity to, to, to uh, identify your local drop box. But the best way to locate a local drop box is through your local clerk's office. One of the reasons why we continue to make to, to have it be decentralized like that is not just because it's the clerk's authority to uh, place your local Dropbox, but because voters can only use their local Dropbox. You can't use a Dropbox in another community to return your ballot. And that was an issue in 2020 that we, for the most part, rectified, uh, but I'm sure uh, others can, can attest to uh, challenges at first in making sure citizens knew you could only use the Dropbox in your local community. And so, if we were to advertise statewide every Dropbox in the state, it may make for a great visual, but it really isn't useful for the voters who need it. And it could be misused by someone trying to manipulate the process or uh, harm Dropboxes all throughout the state. And so in order to protect the security, the information of the location of Dropboxes is, is uh, most reliably disseminated from your local clerk. Thank you. And I, Matt, go ahead. Just add a piece of that. I, I think Voters should also ask their clerks to install drop boxes. We still see some communities out there who are reluctant to have more than one drop box or anything at all. Uh, and it's a really useful tool. The AAC um, allows for, you know, is my audio okay? I'm getting a message that it's not. It's a little garbled. Okay, let's see here. How's that? Much better. Okay, great. Um, we're, you know, the EAC has recommended, uh, and this is the uh, Election Assistance Commission at the federal level, has recommended that every jurisdiction have uh, one drop box for every 15 to 20,000 voters. And I think every jurisdiction should meet that. I also think that it's important that they're not only, what, what we did see in some jurisdictions is that they would have multiple drop boxes at one location. Encourage your clerk to have drop boxes all across your city or your township. It does no use, I think, if you have you know, four drop boxes essentially all at the city clerk's office because not everybody in the community is getting equal access to them. So I would just encourage people to you know, contact their local clerks, but also contact your legislators and make sure that this is something they know that you value. Clerk Doyle, anything you want to add there since you are a clerk? Um, well, like I said, in Pontiac, we do have uh, seven um, ballot drop boxes. And I worked really hard to strategically place each one of those ballot drop boxes pretty much in a centralized area in that voting district. And in most cases, they were, well, we have one at City Hall, but at a school or a community center or a fire station, like a recognizable location, so where voters in that particular area would have easy access. And then we, of course, publicize them. Great. So here's a question. I think this might be most um, pertinent for Agogo and Clerk Doyle, but um, uh, it, the, Wendy wants to know, um, is there unity among clerks on both sides of the aisle on the resources needed for a safe and secure election? Yeah. 
Yeah, I would just, um, you know, we earlier this year, uh, we had a number of listening sessions with clerks across the state, including with Garland uh, and with Claire, uh, to talk about this question uh, specifically. And, you know, I think there is some unity on a number of different issues. Uh, I think all the clerks that we've talked to want a early vote period with actual tabulation because a number of voters complain during the election that, hey, you know, I don't want an absentee ballot that I put in an envelope. I want to put it in an actual tabulation and it a tabulation machine. And it would help uh, with the amount of, uh, you know, absentee ballots that people have to process because there's no going back uh, to the way it used to be where the vast majority of the voting takes place on election day. Um, I think people are also very much united that there needs to be uh, more resources uh, for pre-processing, um, supplies, uh, funding for workers. Uh, you know, this is, you know, pre-processing and, and the, the processing of absentee ballots used to be like an afterthought. As I said before, it, only a quarter of the electorate was voting absentee. Now it's the vast majority. Uh, and you know, the budgets uh, haven't caught up to this new reality. So there needs to be a real recognition by the legislature that they need to step in. If, if they're going to criticize uh, private and outside funding sources for meeting the needs that they won't need, then they need to step up and meet that need. Uh, so you know, I think those are some of the, the high level uh, things that I think all clerks are united on, but I'd love to hear from uh, an actual clerk. I would agree with um, pretty much everything that you uh, said. Uh, in particular with uh, absentee ballots, it's a lot of labor intense um, to the whole processing process, the issuing of the ballot, the receiving back of the ballot, the, the verification, if there's an error, contacting the voter as opposed to when you vote on election day, it's kind of like a transaction that kind of happens instantly and then it's over. But to do absentee ballots is a lot of processing involved. In addition um, to that, because a number of other entities were also sending out uh, absentee ballot applications, we did get bombarded with um, multiple applications from voters. That's probably the only downside I would see. And some voters did complain, like, didn't you send me an application? I'm like, we only sent you one application. This is an outside entity. They didn't necessarily understand that. But from the clerk's office standpoint, any application we get in, we still have to verify that that is um, just only one application and not a duplicate. So that's a lot of labor intensive. And, as, and you're right, as it relates to the uh, budget, like right now in the city of Pontiac, we're about to enter um, our budget um, season for the upcoming budget. So I now have some data that I can show the difference of why I need additional uh, resources and positions because of the increase of absentee. Thank you. The, there's a question from Don um, and it regards businesses and corporations that are getting engaged against these measures um, that are attempting to restrict voting in Michigan. And the question is, do you see any flexibility or any differences among Republican legislators, um, either because of corporate engagement or because they too realize that the best thing for our democracy is to encourage informed voting and not inhibit it? Are you seeing any movement? Well, I think in, in recent days, we've seen a lot of uh, business leaders and sports leaders and others continue to step up. But this to me is a continuation of how a number of them stepped up, not just in, in words, but with action by offering their employees the day off so they could serve ele as election workers last year and a number of other things that businesses all around the state and country did to help make our democracy work. I, I've said in many different settings that democracy is a team sport. And as my remarks earlier really underscore, it takes all of us working together to make it successful. And so I'm grateful for the business leaders who are stepping up now and will um, continue to connect with them to encourage their involvement uh, in uh, making sure that their employees know that they've got their backs as voters 
and also that they can use their platforms to speak the truth about our elections uh, and ensure that any policies developed around our elections are furthered based on that data and the facts and the truth as opposed to misguided partisan agendas. Maybe we can move then to the, the next question here from Sam because this, this continues um, a question for you, Secretary Benson. It's, um, is there anything that can be done to prevent state and county board um, canvassers from not certifying the county elections based on misinformation, propaganda, and other things? Yeah, I mean, what we saw this year was, um, unfortunately, partisans appointed to those commissions using or threatening to use their positions to slow down or confuse the process uh, really outside the bounds of their own authority. Uh, and so there are a number of things that can be done. I think, you know, one, we make we need to make sure there are good people in those roles. And, and the process is right now that parties nominate them, which enables partisans to have really an unfortunate uh, role in, in using the process to further political goals. The, the courts can step in as well uh, to um, force those individuals to do their very clear ministerial job of, of approving the canvas. But we also want to make sure, and there's not, no reason why we shouldn't make sure, that the canvas is as pristine as possible. And that's why one of the things we've asked the legislature to do is give our clerks more time to complete the canvas. Because a lot of the, the questions, at least this past year, emerged around uh, things that could have been resolved with more time. And it's essentially that the heart of it was when people show up to precincts and you have an inconsistency in terms of the list of registered voters and the list of voters who showed up and the list of people who got ballots and all of those things. Now, usually what a canvas does is look at the procedures that a clerk applied and then explain any inconsistencies. They usually can be explained by, oh, in this instance, the voter showed up to the wrong precinct. So they signed in and then left without getting a ballot. And that's why there's an inconsistency there. And indeed, with more time, that's precisely what our over 250 audits really were, were intended to, uh, to, to illustrate. And, uh, and, and so with more time in the canvas, that eliminates some of the um, uh, potential arguments that canvassers acting in bad faith might try to use. Uh, to slow down the process. Uh, and so I think that's another thing that can be done as well. Uh, but I think vigilance and certainly the number of people who showed up, for example, the Wayne County Board of Canvassers meeting to make sure their voices were heard uh, was uh, critical in both raising awareness about what was attempted there uh, and, uh, and calling it out for the, the racist undertones and the racism that it entailed. I have one more question directed right to you, Secretary Benson, and then we'll, I'm sure we'll get some questions for our other two guests. But um, Cameron wants to know how your office has worked to improve online and self-service stations for voters and all Michiganders this year. Well, we have installed over 150 self-service stations uh, and upgraded our computer systems in our offices uh, so that citizens can skip going to a branch office in order to renew their license or their license plate. And so it's great to see those self-service stations being used across the state. We've also put them in Meyer and Kroger and hope to expand them to other locations. Things move somewhat slowly in a bureaucracy is in particularly when it comes to technology. So it takes time to both upgrade technology and implement and install new machines, but that's the direction we're moving in. My hope and my goal would be to continue to uh, eliminate the reasons you need to go to a branch office. And that's really the work that would minimize wait times for those who are going to branch offices. Of course, during COVID, we've had uh, to open our, our offices only to appointment only to protect against crowding. Uh, and that certainly is a procedure that's going to also continue for the near future as we emerge out of this pandemic. Uh, and, and then finally, for voting as well, certainly the ability to vote absentee is the essence of self-service. So that's why enabling citizens to easily request their uh, application or easily request to vote absentee uh, by mailing them an application or making it available, available online was such a critical component to ensuring that voters could access uh, e tools to easily exercise their right to vote. So we'll continue to look at more ways to do all those things in the future, uh, but I'm really proud of the progress we've made in just two years to, to provide more self-service options for all of our citizens. That's great. Um, you know, most of our conversation today is about how we can incentivize Michiganders to um, feel that their, you know, their involvement really matters, right? Whether through voting or participating in other ways in our democracy. And so the question that, um, 
that comes from Mary, and I think it's for all of you, is really how can um, a listener uh, to this webinar uh, or get involved? How can they volunteer for election protection? What's, what are the best means? Well, certainly I'll, I'll speak for the um, state office. You know, if you want to be a poll worker, go to michigan.gov slash democracy MVP. Um, and I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, Clerk Doyle for some in, in information on how to, to help support our local clerks. Well, feel free to, to contact the uh, clerk's office. Our number is 248-758-3200. Again, this is a municipal election year for us. So we are looking for um, poll workers for both the uh, primary and general election. And we would love to have you. Um, I hired an outstanding trainer uh, last year. So we do do a lot of uh, training. As a matter of fact, we did a uh, mock election before the election because we had an influx of new workers. Make sure we worked out any um, particular uh, kinks. So know that you will be trained uh, well and we pay for the uh, training as well too. Agogo, any final words on that? Yeah, I would say, I think a, one thing that everyone can do very easily, regardless, is to be informed. Uh, be informed about your rights and be informed about what is actually taking place in your own community. Um, you know, the reason why disinformation and, and all the misinformation we're seeing uh, across this landscape is, is deepening is because people feel free to say that without being challenged. If you hear someone saying something that's not accurate, gently inform them. We are our own advocates and make sure that people know that this was the most, probably I think the most successful election, especially under the circumstances that we've ever had in the state of Michigan. And we should all be proud of that because we all made that ha happen. So don't allow people to lie about things that happen in your own backyard, in your own community, push back. Thank you. I want to thank not only our esteemed guests for joining us today, but I want to thank all of you for joining us and for your thoughtful and important questions. We got so many questions. We, I really apologize that we couldn't get to all of them, but they were really important. They really helped to, to inform, I think all of the listeners and watchers um, uh, about key elements of our voting process and what we're up against in terms of uh, the, the challenges in this, in this legislative bill package. So um, we've come to the end of our program. Um, I'd like to open a, a short poll question for those turning it, tuning in. Um, uh, if you are on Zoom, you're going to see uh, that there's something that's popped up on your screen and, and we're ramping up recruitment of volunteers for all of our work, our democracy protection, our clean water and climate work. And so if you're interested in volunteering or in other ways to stay engaged, please respond with a yes to the poll. And one of our organizers will follow up with you in the next couple of days. Um, thank you again to our guests. Uh, Secretary Benson, we're really delighted um, to have you in particular and, and thank you so much for your leadership. Uh, again, thank you to, for, to all of you for tuning in. Uh, be safe, be well, and we will see you next time.